Hello, everyone, and welcome to tonight's 2020 Global Peace Index launch webinar. I'm Javon Dominique Kafua, the Assistant Director of Educational Initiatives at the Office of Alumni Relations at Northeastern University. I'm also an alumna. We have the pleasure to have with us this evening alumna Francesca Batalt and from the Institute of Economic and Peace, Charles Allen. To get us started, I want to go over a few housekeeping items. Please keep your microphones on mute and keep your videos off to ensure the best sound quality for all. If you have any questions during this webinar, we encourage you to type them in the chat box and we will be monitoring those as they come in. We'll have a Q&A session about halfway through the presentation as well as at the end. We also recommend that you put your view on speaker view in Zoom. There's a button at the top right hand corner of your screen to do this so that you can see the presentation slides as well as our featured guests both at the same time while they're speaking. This webinar is also being recorded for future viewing. Now I'll turn it over to Francesca. Thank you Javon and good evening everyone and welcome to what I'm sure is going to be a most exciting webinar. As Javon said, my name is Francesca. I'm a Northeastern alumni, having graduated in 2019 from the College of Social Science and Humanities with a degree in politics, philosophy, and economics. I'm currently pursuing a master's in international relations at the London School of Economics. And I have the privilege of being your co-host and moderator for this evening. I just wanted to acknowledge and thank a few people for making this event possible. Uh, firstly, our Office of Alumni Relations, um, particularly our VP Rick Davis and obviously Javon, without whom this event simply would not have been materialized. Secondly, to Denise Garcia for the introduction to both the IEP's work in my sophomore year at Northeastern and for the introduction to our distinguished speaker, Charles, tonight. And last but not least, the IEP and Charlie um, for the fantastic work they're doing and for being so generous as to launch um, their latest Global Peace Index to our um, Northeastern community. Tonight, I have the pleasure of introducing you to Charles Allen from the Institute for Economics and Peace. Charlie is the Director of Partnerships at the IEP. These partnerships are strategic and grassroots partners, inclusive of governments, non-government organizations, educational organizations, service groups, and other institutes. His recent works have been with partners in Zimbabwe, Uganda, Kenya, Cambodia, India, Thailand, and Australia. Through these strategic partnerships, Charlie is activating IEP's Positive Peace Framework globally. Positive Peace is defined as the attitudes, institutions, and structures that create and sustain peaceful societies. It is based on the empirical research of the Institute for Economics and Peace and provides us with a framework to first understand and then to address the multiple and complex challenges the world faces. It is transformational and cross-cutting approach to peace. It works to develop strength and resilience within nations and communities creating an optimum environment in which human potential can flourish. Charlie, thank you for joining us all the way from Australia tonight. And without further ado, over to you. Thank you, Francesca, for, for the introduction. Uh, and uh, I'd just like to start with a, a couple of acknowledgements. Uh, first of all, it's, it's customary in this country in accordance with uh, Aboriginal law to acknowledge the country that, uh, that we're on. I'm sitting here in uh, Gadigal country of the Aurora Nation, so I'd like to acknowledge uh, the traditional owners of the, the Gadigal country, and I pay my respects to their elders, both past and present. Uh, um, I'd also like to give a shout out for uh, uh, all of the Northeastern co-ops that have, have worked here, at, uh, interned here at uh, IEP, and we have a long relationship, uh, and certainly uh, Denise Garcia is, is one of the key key uh, supporters of that relationship with Northeastern University and uh, Northeastern Co-ops are, are significant contributors to uh, IEP's work uh, and actively work in building uh, our research search briefs. Uh, it's, it's a, I think this is the first time for quite some time that we haven't had Northeastern uh, Co-ops uh, in here at uh, our headquarters in, in Australia. So, uh, and also thank you to Francesca and Javan for, for making this, this, this event uh, come about. All right, so I'll get into uh, the, the launch uh, and I'll just share screen with you. Uh, 
Uh, so the, the Institute for, for Economics and Peace, uh, first of all, we're a, a global uh, independent think tank. Uh, and to, to sum up our work where we're in the business of, of measuring peace, uh, not only measuring peace, but also putting a cost on uh, the economic benefit of peace and the ec economic impact of uh, violence. Uh, so why do we do this work? It's, it's pretty simple. Prior to us starting this work, uh, nobody was doing it. Uh, our founder recognised uh, there was a gap and sort of asked the question, well, how is it that uh, people who are involved in peace building such change development, how can actually uh, manage uh, their work without having some, some uh, meaningful full indicators? Uh, so the Institute was, was uh, developed to, to fill that that gap. So uh, the Institute, as I've mentioned, is uh, headquartered here in Sydney, uh, but we'll have also have offices globally uh, in Harare, in New York City, uh, and uh, in Europe and Mexico, sorry. Uh, so we, our, our research, we're very much about making our research readable, usable, uh, and uh, accessible. Uh, we like to position it as a practitioner uh, research. Uh, and you can see from, from these numbers that we have a significant reach with, uh, with our research. Last 12, over the last 12 year, a 12 month period, we had a, a media reach of some uh, 16 billion, a uh, social media reach of just under a billion. Uh, we were picked up in 150 different countries. Uh, we published some 10 reports and referenced across a, a large number of, of books uh, and certainly 1.3 unique visitors to our website. You can see there that uh, our work is, is picked up by a number of uh, the multilateral organisations where we're referenced across a large number of uh, university programs. I mentioned that we're an inter international organisation and, and where we're located across, across the globe. Uh, headquartered here in Sydney, our founder is an Australian, uh, hence why we're, we're headquartered here. So the Global Peace Index, uh, tonight's event is about uh, launching the, the 2020 Global Peace Index. Uh, and the 2020 Global Peace Index is the 14th edition. Uh, that in itself is, is significant because we've got over, over a decade, nearly a decade and a half of data. So we can look at uh, trends across uh, uh, over a decade and you know, break down those trends into countries, regions, uh, domains, and, and get uh, a really good read on, on what's happening globally, not only at point in time, but uh, uh, through looking at that trend data. Uh, our work covers 163 nation states. Clearly, that's not all of the countries, but it picks up 99.7% percent of the global population. We uh, look at a country that we don't look at a country and say it is peaceful or not peaceful, we rank countries. Uh, our researchers are uh, quantitative researchers where we aggregate a whole lot of uh, uh, data sets, bring them together to, to develop this, uh, this index using those 23 indicators uh, and rank country from the most peaceful to the, to the least peaceful. The, the, the work is developed by the Institute of Economics and Peace, but it's guided and overseen by an international panel of, of experts. As I said, we, uh, we aggregate uh, 23 different data sets for the, for the Global Peace Index, and, and they are broken down into three domains. Those three domains are, as you would expect, uh, conflict, both uh, internal conflict or domestic conflict and international conflict. Uh, measures of uh, societal safety. So that's really picking up on internal indicators, homicide rate, incarceration rates, impact of terrorism uh, uh, within a nation state, uh, IDPs. Uh, and as you'd also expect measures of, of militarization, uh, cost of uh, uh, milex per, as a percentage of GDP, sorry, military expenditures as a percentage of uh, GDP, um, service personnel, access to small arms uh, and heavy weapons. So there's a, a number of indicators that we bring in for militarisation. So looking at uh, the, uh, the, the, the key findings for the 2020 Global Peace Index, so I guess the, the question is uh, over 2019, did the globe become more peaceful or did it become less peaceful? Uh, unfortunately, it became uh, less peaceful. This is what the, the globe looks like when uh, uh, when uh, you paint out uh, the countries according to their, their levels of peace, peacefulness, uh, the red countries 
being the least peaceful, uh, the, the dark green countries being uh, the, the most peaceful uh, and the colours in between. Uh, uh, so, so this uh, map is available on our website, I should say. So our, our main community facing website is Vision of Humanity. Uh, this, this map is uh, live with uh, data sitting underneath it. You can hover over uh, your current country of interest and not only look at uh, the current uh, results for the 2020 Global Peace Index, but look at uh, the data back over the last decade. As I said, the, the globe has become uh, less peaceful over the last 12, 12 months uh, by 0.34%. You might think, wow, that's not a very big percentage. Is, is that really significant? I can assure you uh, that it, it, uh, uh, it is significant. Uh, and it's also the, the ninth deterioration we've had over a, the uh, a 12 year period. Uh, the previous, the 2019 Global Peace Index, we saw a slight rise in peacefulness. Uh, we were hoping that was a, a trend that it was going to, going to continue. And certainly that uh, wasn't uh, the case. And we strongly suspect that, that won't be the case for the 2021 Global Peace Index, given the, the current global shock. I'll talk more about that uh, a bit further on. So 81 countries became more peaceful, 80 countries uh, deteriorated. Um, you can see that's uh, uh, nearly 50-50, but uh, clearly what happened is the countries that deteriorated, uh, de deteriorated by a larger percentage. Uh, the indicators that uh, drove improvements uh, was uh, uh, terrorism impact uh, decreased, homicide rates continues to, to decrease, uh, and weapons imports, exports uh, decreased globally. Uh, the indicators that, that deteriorated uh, political terror scale, uh, refugees and IDPs continue to trend in a, in a bad direction, uh, and the intensity of internal conflicts also decreased. Um, looking at uh, highlights, uh, Iceland was the most peaceful country. Uh, once again, uh, with the largest improvements we saw in uh, Azerbaijan and Armenia, uh, that's due to a peace accord that was signed there and that it's held. And certainly Russia and Eurasia had the uh, largest uh, regional improvements. And Europe remains the most peaceful region, uh, despite uh, some deteriorations in its, its uh, political stability. Other highlights or lowlights, if you like, Afghanistan remains the, the the least peaceful nation on the globe. Benin and Nicaragua experienced largest deteriorations due to conflict in those countries. South America and Central America had the largest regional deteriorations. Uh, the Middle East and North Africa, the MENA region, remains the least peaceful region. However, we are seeing improvements there, uh, to reduction in battlefield deaths, as well as impact of terrorism and internal conflict. So top 10. Uh, looking at uh, the top 10, uh, you can see they're, they're numbered off, off there. As I mentioned, Iceland is, is the most peaceful country on the globe. If you're looking at trends uh, across the, the top 10, uh, Europe countries uh, are well represented there as uh, Asia Pacific uh, countries. Uh, other trends you would see in the, in the uh, top 10, it seems to help to be a democracy. Uh, it seems to help to be a small country. Uh, it also seems to help to be cold. They're not indicators that we capture, but uh, there's some of the, the commonalities in the, uh, in the top 10. Uh, least peaceful. Afghanistan is the least peaceful country, uh, as I said, uh, and uh, you can see there that uh, MENA countries and sub-Saharan African countries feature highly in the, uh, the top 10. So five greatest improvers for 2020. Uh, there they are. I've already mentioned Armenia and Azerbaijan because of uh, decreased uh, conflict in, in those two countries and between those two countries, but also Honduras, South Africa and Bahrain were, were uh, good improvers in 2020. Greatest deteriorations, uh, Benin and Nicaragua, uh, and all, all of these deteriorations are a result of uh, uh, conflict. Uh, Venezuela, uh, Chile and uh, Nigeria, uh, the large deteriorating countries uh, in the globe for 2020. So, as I said, uh, we've been capturing this data or producing these reports for, for well over a decade now. 
uh, which gives us some some good trend data to to have a look at. We'll just briefly have a look at uh, some of that 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 trend data. Um, so if you look at P since two, 2008, which is a 12 year period, you can see uh, the, uh, the trend line here. Uh, IEP graphs are counterintuitive. A higher number means uh, less, less peaceful, lower number uh, more peaceful. So that rising trend line is, uh, is, is not positive. Uh, and you can see that steady trend over, over the last 12 year period. Uh, the bar graph in uh, below shows the that as, as I mentioned before, of the last uh, 12 years, we've only had three years, those green years, where, where peace has uh, improved. Over the last uh, decade, uh, you can see that uh, 81 countries have become less peaceful and 79 countries have become more peaceful. Once again, it's, it's fairly close, but uh, the gross overall outcome is over that uh, the last decade, we've had a decrease in peacefulness of 2.5% globally. When you bring that down to, to domains, those three domains that I mentioned, what's happened over those uh, three domains, you can see that uh, militarisation, remembering that uh, trend line going down is a good sign. Militarisation has steadily dropped away over that, that 10 year period. So that's sort of, uh, reduction in uh, GDP expenditure on militarisation, uh, the standardised numbers of military personnel per 100,000 uh, are some of the indicators that have dropped away. Security and safety has stayed trended uh, relatively uh, stable with a, a slight rise over that 10 year period. But certainly the indicator that has, has continued to, to trend up has been uh, ongoing, ongoing conflict and that's what's having that impact on uh, global peacefulness. So, you know, as, uh, as I mentioned, you know, it, uh, when you look at countries, it's about neck and neck for, for countries that have uh, become more peaceful and those that have become less peaceful. The reality is that uh, the countries that have become less peaceful uh, have done so by a greater extent. So it really sort of brings out this, this, this issue of it in, inequality in global peace. It's not unlike that saying, saying the, uh, uh, the rich are getting richer, the poor are getting poorer. Uh, the least peaceful are becoming uh, less peaceful uh, and the more peaceful continue to trend in, in, in the right direction. That's a growing gap uh, between the least and least uh, uh, peaceful nations is, is really concerning. So when you start to look at the trends, breaking them down into the, those domains, here's a really quick snapshot of the uh, safety and security indicators. You can see that terrorism, uh, you know, we had that 2000 in, uh, spike in 2014. So that was the height of uh, uh, the, the ISIS uh, era, if you like. So since uh, the reduction in ISIS activity, that the impact of terrorism has, has dropped away since that 2014 spike. Uh, IDGs, uh, IDPs and refugees continues to, to rise. Uh, we're actually up to, it's, it's actually surpassed that now. We're, uh, we're uh, uh, I think over 75 million people have been displaced uh, globally. Uh, so that's, you know, 1% uh, of the global population is, is, is now to place, displaced. Uh, what is really encouraging is, is this trend in homicide rates, which is, have continued uh, to trend down and trend down significantly, which is a, a, a global trend. Uh, there's a few regions that uh, are bucking that, uh, bucking that trend, certainly uh, Central America and Southern America, uh, South America are the, the regions that are bucking that trend. Ongoing conflict indicators, uh, so battlefield deaths, you can see that the battlefield deaths uh, trend line is very similar to the, uh, the terrorism trend line. It has decreased since the since, since the, the rise or since the, the peak of ISIS activity. Uh, total conflicts has uh, increased and the intensity of internal conflicts has, has also in, increased. Looking at militarization indicators, and I mentioned these briefly before, you can see that the number of armed service personnel has decreased, slight kick up in, in uh, the, the last year. Uh, military expenditure uh, also has 
uh, has decreased with a slight rise in the, the last year. Uh, weapon in, imports uh, have, have bounced about with an overall trend, trend upwards. So I just, uh, before we go to some, 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 some initial questions, I, I just want to talk briefly to uh, civil unrest. Uh, certainly civil unrest is uh, an issue that's probably front of mind for for a lot of us, I know a lot of, know a lot of people that are, are joining from uh, United States and certainly is an issue that is, is front of mind with the Black Lives Matter campaign as it uh, is very alive in, uh, in this country, Australia, with uh, the Aboriginal deaths in, in custody uh, concerns. So we, uh, don't, we, we like to be very, not detailed and deaf to what are, are current global issues and certainly civil unrest is a, is a current global issue. So looking at the, the data and the trends of civil unrest from 2011 to, to 2019, you can see that uh, in uh, the three categories of riots, general strikes uh, and demonstrations, there's been a significant increase over that period of 244%. Uh, riots, and so when you disaggregate that, riots have seen an increase of 282%, general strikes an increase of 821% over, over that period. Uh, 96 countries recorded violent demonstrations in 2019. It could be said that 2019 uh, was a year of uh, uh, demonstrations. I, I uh, certainly think that'll be eclipsed by uh, 2020 uh, when, when you're looking at that, that indicator. What is driving those demonstrations? Economic hardship, uh, race, uh, police brutality uh, and corruption. Uh, Europe had the largest number of protests uh, with uh, 1,600 recorded events. But what is interesting about uh, uh, Europe is that uh, a large percentage of the demonstrations uh, in Europe, 65%, uh, were non-violent. Uh, so when you look at uh, uh, the trend lines uh, of uh, civil unrest across those, those three categories, uh, you can see uh, that steady rise over the 12 year period, but certainly with this, this really large kick up in, in, in recent times and this, this, this uh, uh, spiking trend line, I suggest is a, a trend that we will see continue with the 2020 data. So we might, uh, before we move on, uh, there's some other, uh, some other aspects of the 2020 Global Peace Index that I'd like to, like to discuss, but just like to open it for questions at, at uh, this point, uh, before we move into the, the next categories. Great, thank you so much, Shani. So we actually have two questions that are linked to the United States. The first one is, um, what is the current ranking of the Global Peace Index? And the second one is, can we get an understanding as to why the US has such a, a low score assigned, leaving them only two places ahead of the Congo? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I, I suspect I might get this question now, given there's a, there's a large uh, uh, US audience and, and it's, it's a really good question. Yeah, the, the US is positioned at 121 in the global peace index. So it is positioned very lowly. So remembering number one, most peaceful, 163, least peaceful, a sitting 121 is not a good place to be sitting on, on the, the global peace index. So I, I, I ask you to, to uh, and uh, we, we, our research is not qualitative research. We, we aggregate uh, quantitative da data so we, we don't bring in uh, uh, moral judgment or moral values in, into uh, that aggregation of, of data, if you like. I, I should say that some of the data sets that we use are, are, are produced from qualitative means. So to answer the question is, is why does the US sit at uh, 121? I should also mention that, uh, interestingly, the US uh, improved in the 2020 Global Peace Index. Uh, in 2019, the US at 126. Uh, and that improvement uh, in the US is, is due to de decreased military activity, particularly in uh, Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, so some of the, the major indicators that, uh, and, and certainly, 
uh, observations are that uh, military, oh, sorry, US is, is unfairly judged in the, in the global peace index because of uh, its, uh, uh, its military presence uh, globally. Uh, and certainly some of those military indicators do impact on uh, the US's uh, position. I should say they're not uh, the largest indicators or the, the most negative indicators. Certainly the largest uh, impact on US's position in the, the global peace index is incarceration rate. Uh, uh, the US incarcerates its citizens at uh, an alarming uh, rate when it's standard, standardised against uh, uh, global standards. Uh, another indicator is, is small arms. Uh, the US uh, arms its citizens at, uh, at, a, at an alarming rate, uh, as we're certainly all aware it, it has the largest number of uh, guns per, per 100 households uh, uh, globally. Uh, from a military perspective, it, uh, its, its percentage of GDP spend is, is, uh, is uh, average when you, when you look at it across the globe, even though the military expenditure uh, as, a, as a total figure is very high when it's standardised by that uh, GDP spend as a, a percentage of GDP spend, it's, it's not uh, uh, overly significant. Um, obviously, uh, heavy weapons uh, and nuclear weapons uh, are a negative indicator in the in the global peace index and, and US uh, also that drags its positions down. So they're, they're probably some of the highlights of the, of the indicators that, that have an impact on the US's position. Thank you for the question. Thanks, Charlie. I think we have one have time for one more and um, I would say the question that links well into this would be what current dynamics of armed conflicts and future challenges are difficult to measure with indicators and do you feel that any particular dynamic is not well reflected in the indicators? Yeah um, yeah I, 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 I guess you know so we're, we're, we're focused on the the global peace index today and the global peace index it uh, uses a, a negative definition of peace so the absence of violence or the absence of, of fear of violence so really the the global peace index is measuring the bad stuff if you like you know we're, we're looking uh, and counting and aggregating those indicators that are impact uh, 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 based on that definition of uh, absence of violence or absence of fear of violence I really think that uh, the Global Peace Index needs to be read in conjunction with uh, uh, our positive peace report, uh, we'd also, which also ranks countries from the most peaceful to the least peaceful, but based on the positive indicators. So, uh, uh, so the, the definition that we use for the positive peace report is the attitudes, institutions and, and structures uh, that create and sustain uh, peaceful communities. So it really is a measure of a country's or nation state's capacity uh, to, to be peaceful. Uh, so I really think to, to get a, a deeper understanding, uh, uh, this is a long way to answer this question, I uh, need to look uh, across both of those reports to build an understanding of you know, where a country or a nation state sits uh, from a negative perspective as, as well as a, a positive perspective. You know, coming back to the observations are around uh, United States. The United States sits in a far better position in the positive peace report than it does in the, the, the global peace index, which is an indicator that, uh, uh, that that positive peace <coughs> surplus is an indicator that has a, a far greater, a, 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 the potential to be far greater, to fare far greater in the global peace index than it actually does. Uh, thank you for the question. And uh, you know, across those two two reports, are there gaps? Yes, absolutely, there are. Uh, but uh, we we need uh, to to be able to aggregate data across those 163 countries. We need uh, reliable uh, and reputable uh, data sets that uh, are captured across those 163 nation states. Clearly, there are some data gaps that we look to. Uh, to fill and look for proxy indicators when, uh, when, when there are, are gaps. Are there opportunities to improve the, the indices, whether it's the Global Peace Index or the, uh, the 
the positive police report, yes, absolutely they are. Uh, and if the if the data sets exist or come into existence there, that's certainly something that's taken into account by our international panel of experts. Thank you for the question. One last one um, is asking if you look at any indicators of peacefulness online and on social media platforms as part of your indicators. Uh, the no is probably the, the, the short answer. Uh, certainly the, the positive peace report uh, looks at a free flow of information as, as one of the pillars. Uh, we're not, not talking about the positive peace report today. So, and certainly the, the proliferation or, or access to social media uh, as, as uh, uh, under that pillar of free flow of information has, has an impact on a country's peacefulness from those, those positive indicators, uh, but not within, the, not within the Global Peace Index. Great, thank you so much, Charlie. I think we can keep going with the rest of the presentation if you'd like. Sure, thank you. I'll share the screen with you uh, once again. Okay, so I just want to touch on the, the economic, uh, economic value of peace. Uh, uh, our, we are the Institute for Economics and Peace, and yes, we do measure peace, but we also look at uh, the economic impact of violence and also the economic benefit of, of peace. So I ask you to uh, think uh, about you know, what, what you think would be the, the global economic cost, uh, global economic uh, impact of, of violence per, per annum, and try to picture what that number would be in, uh, in your head. Uh, and uh, this is, is what, it, what it looks like. It's $14.5 trillion per annum. So every year, uh, the impact of violence is costing the, the globe at this point, uh, $14.5 trillion, which is a huge amount of money. Uh, to put that in other terms, uh, $14.5 trillion is 10.6% of the, the total global GDP or bring it to a per person amount, it's nearly $2,000, 2000 American US dollars uh, per, for every person that's on, on the globe, uh, which is an enormous amount of money. You know, to put that in, in perspective, if we were to, to develop a global education system, this is some research on, on uh, what would be the cost per head person to have a, a suitable global uh, education system has costed about uh, fifty dollars US dollars per head globally. Uh, obviously, there's a great variance between uh, high-income countries and low-income countries, but if you, if you standardise that over over the globe, it's about the cost. Similarly, if you look at a, a global health system, it's costed at about ninety dollars uh, per per person on on the globe. Uh, hospitals and doctors are a little bit more expensive than schools and, and teachers. Uh, once again, that, that would vary from high income to low income countries, but you know, they're, they're, uh, I think they're very sobering reminders of, uh, 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 to get an understanding of how significant uh, that cost is. Another way to think of it is you know, the, when you look at uh, the earning rates of, of individuals and over a third of the, <laughs> the globe uh, learn, uh, earn a dollar, uh, a dollar or less uh, US per day, uh, it's, it's a very sobering figure. So we often talk about, well, what, what, what would be the impact if, if we could reduce that global expenditure by 10% per, per annum and, and save that 10%, we'd say $1.45 uh, trillion uh, uh, per annum, which is you know, a significant amount of money that could be redirected to uh, great, better economic activities and, and uh, building more peaceful pursuits, education, health, just to, to name a couple. When you break down that economic impact, you can see that uh, military expenditure is, is the large percentage of that at 40.5%, uh, 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 followed by internal security expenditure at 34.1%. So this is, you know, uh, uh, cops, prisons, uh, uh, other internal security 
people. I see homicides uh, features are largely there at 7.7%, uh, suicides at 5.2%. Uh, okay, so uh, I mentioned before that we, we certainly don't like to be tone deaf to what are current, current trends globally. You know, COVID-19 is the most significant global shock uh, at this point in time, if not, <laughs> uh, it, it, uh, it across history it is certainly a, a significant global shock. We're conscious that uh, we rule the line through our data sets on the 31st of, of, of March and then develop uh, uh, the Global Peace Index. So the data I just uh, shared with you around the 2020 Global Peace Index, uh, that data uh, set finished on the 31st of March 2020. I suggest that was only the start of uh, the impact of, of COVID. So uh, you know, it's really interesting to think about well, what is going to be the uh, impact of COVID-19 on, on peace. And this is sort of some, some early indications that uh, we're seeing um, from various trend, from, uh, trend data. Uh, firstly, uh, probably don't need us to tell you this, I think most of us know it, that uh, so certainly, COVID infection uptakes, particularly early in the piece, were strongly correlated uh, with, uh, with air travel. We saw large, uh, the larger outbreaks were initially in the larger uh, air, uh, air travel hubs, uh, London, uh, New York, uh, parts of Italy. Uh, certainly they were uh, early hubs for uh, infection rates. We, Expect that to most of the indicators in the global index, and you know, I've given you a, a summary of the, the the indicators that we rely on. I should mention that all our reports are freely available on, online. If you want to delve uh, deeper into our methodology, I really encourage you to to access our reports through our our, our community facing website, which is Vision of Humanity. Uh, coming back to this point, the we expect. Uh, most of the indicators to deteriorate. Uh, some exceptions will probably be uh, military expenditure. Uh, we're seeing some early signs of a reduction in, in military expenditure as countries are diverting resources to prop up uh, their economies. There's some interesting early trends in, in crime data. We're seeing some violent crimes uh, data decreasing in uh, the, the early uh, phases of uh, the COVID era uh, drug dealing is another aggregate where we're seeing temporary reductions. Uh, however, having said that, we've seen spikes in other uh, crime types, uh, domestic violence, uh, suicide driven, uh, suicide and mental illness related issues. Uh, US and, and Europe are expected to, we're expecting to see increases in political instability. Uh, US and China relations uh, deteriorating, we're seeing this having an impact on uh, multilateral organisations, World Health Organisation, World Trade Organisation uh, and UN portfolios. <clears throat> we're expecting to see a decrease in support for UN peacekeeping operations, once again, as, as domestic resources are diverted to, to domestic issues to prop up uh, economies. Uh, ODA or Overseas Developmental Aid is, is likely to decrease as, as funds are used once again domestically uh, and this is really concerning for a fragile state such as Liberia, Afghanistan, Burundi, uh, South Sudan. And countries with uh, low credit ratings are certainly going to find difficulty in, in, in raising cash to, to sustain their economies. Some exam good examples there are uh, Brazil, Pakistan, Argentina, Venezuela. So uh, we, we, we've uh, had a look at the OECD countries and, and certainly this, this collection here is, is not all the countries, uh, it is OECD countries and uh, the BRIC group of countries and, and a few others. And we had a look at, had a look at their early performance uh, in, the, in the COVID era. And what we did was look at their, their economic strength coming into the COVID era against their, their ranking on the, the, against the positive peace report, which I've, I've uh, mentioned earlier on. Uh, so unsurprisingly, uh, the countries that 
had high economic uh, strength coming into the, uh, the COVID era and higher uh, positive peace, uh, faring better with their, first of all, their response and secondary uh, recovery uh, to COVID-19. Uh, and you can see the, that group of countries there. Um, I just realised that, that that's uh, incorrect there. They should be the other way around. So uh, high economic strength coming into the COVID era and higher positive peace. Uh, so that, that, that's uh, uh, higher positive peace being a, a, a measure of a country's resilience. We can see the higher resilient countries with a stronger uh, economic uh, indicators coming in are faring far better. Uh, and the, the reverse is true as you expect. Uh, countries with a lower positive peace and who are less sound economically are not faring as well in their response and recovery during the, to the COVID era. Some interesting early data on uh, battle deaths and uh, riots. And I'm very conscious that this data is to Q2 2020. And you can see there is a, uh, a reduction in the early phases of the, the COVID era, era in both battlefield deaths uh, and riots. I suspect that, that uh, what we suspect that that uh, that right indicator will change uh, pretty quickly uh, coming into Q, the end of Q2 for, for 2020. Uh, sorry, Q3 for 2020. Oil prices is a, another interesting uh, trend to, to follow. Uh, you know, in 2020, for the first time, we saw uh, oil prices drop into uh, negative. So uh, the last thing I want to touch on, how am I going for time? Okay, uh, so the last thing I just want to touch on very briefly is just give you a preview of uh, a piece of uh, work or a piece of research that is currently underway here. We're due to finish this in, a, in a, uh, or to release this in uh, a few weeks time and, uh, and is looking at uh, uh, ecological threat. Uh, so what we're in the process of developing is a, a ecological threat register. So the intent with this uh, register is to look across the, uh, using our approach of identifying what are available uh, data sets, aggregating those uh, data sets. We are aggregating data across a range of ecological threats, such as uh, water scarcity, uh, food security, uh, natural disasters, uh, uh, population stress, uh, migration, immigration stress, uh, so bringing a, a range of indicators, aggregating them, and then looking at uh, a particular at a particular country's uh, resilience. We're doing this for the 163 nation states that we measure in the, the Global Peace Index, uh, and uh, to identify which are the countries that are at the greatest threat for uh, ecological risk. We're extrapolating this out to, to 2050. So looking which are the countries, which are the regions that are going to face the, the greatest threat in the, the, the coming uh, years and decades. So the intent of, of this register uh, is to provide a tool that, that, that uh, uh, is really practical and usable to inform a policy, uh, influence uh, policy, influence uh, attitudes and influence uh, resourcing decisions is, is the intent of the piece that will work. So I, I'll just uh, touch on a couple of the, the data sets that uh, uh, that we're, we're relying upon. Uh, I, I can't uh, share the outcomes of the economic th threat register, that would be a, a spoiler. Uh, but as I said, it will, will, be, uh, will be available fairly, fairly soon. Um, so, uh, looking at natural disasters, when looking at natural disasters over a uh, nearly four decade period, you can see that steady climb and the reality is, is natural disasters have quadrupled over the last 40 year period, uh, with the largest rises being hydrological uh, events, uh, which includes uh, floods, uh, uh, landslides and the like. Uh, and the other one is uh, meteorolo meteorological events, uh, cyclones uh, and other weather events. You can see that the blue and the green indicators uh, the largest rises across those bar graphs. Uh, one that's very ne near and dear to Australia's hearts is or, uh, fire threat, and that has 
been has had some rise, but has been somewhat uh, uh, steady over over the period. And certainly, Australia has felt the bite of uh, fire threat in the, the last fire season. So that's very sobering uh, data when you look at the, the trends in natural disasters over a 40 year period. Water related risk, uh, there's quite a bit of data, quite a bit of information loaded into these bar graphs, but uh, just sort of the, the high level observations is, is you can see the regions that are at most risk uh, for water related uh, risk and uh, MENA, Middle East and North Africa. Uh, being the region that's most at risk, followed by uh, Southern Asia, and then they, they taper off from there. Food security, uh, we've had a look, ha having a look at uh, uh, food security, and, and uh, this, this graph is looking at the correlation between uh, food security and the positive peace index. And as I said before, the positive peace index is a a measure of a country's country's resilience, and as you would expect, uh, food security uh, correlates very highly to uh, uh, positive peace or or a country's resilience. So, uh, as as I mentioned, uh, I uh, asked you to keep a, a lookout for this piece of piece of work. Uh, it will be released. I think the release date is the twenty sixth of August. Uh, we intend to continue to build this this. Uh, this register over the coming year, so it becomes a, uh, a useful and contemporary uh, resource to look at ecological threat. Um, I mentioned in the body of the, the, the discussion that uh, all of our research is, is freely available on the Vision of Humanity website. Uh, we're, we're very much in the business of, of making our research freely available, making our research readable, usable and, and practical. So uh, if you have uh, uh, interest in a particular country, in a particular region, you can uh, dive deeper uh, from, from either report or from the Vision of Humanity website. Uh, also, if you have an interest in a particular domain or want to dive de deeper into methodology, it's, uh, it's all there uh, for, for you to, to use. Thank you very much for, for listening. And uh, we do have some time for some questions. So I'll, I'll flip back to Francesca. Well, thank you so much, Charlie. Thank you so much, Charlie. We do have some questions here. One of them is uh, relating to whether the IEP is planning to indicate any, to any needs 2021 related to COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, yeah, sorry, I just lost you there, Francesca. I think I can see the, the question. <laughs> uh, are you planning any new indicators for open Yes. Uh, so yes is, is the short answer to, to, to that question. Uh, we, as I said, we ha have been monitoring trends in COVID-19. COVID um, the, the, the current report that, that I produced today, so the, the or, or presented today, the 2020 Global Peace Index only really captures the start of the impact of, of the uh, COVID era. The 2021 Global Peace Index will certainly pick up uh, the impact of the uh, response phase. I suggest we'd still be responding uh, at uh, the, the launch of the 2021 uh, Global Peace Index, but certainly countries will be uh, well into to recovery. You know, I mentioned that we are going to see impact across a great number of the indicators in the Global Peace Index. Are we going to deepen our, our research on uh, COVID-19 and peace? Yes, absolutely. That, that work continues as, as we continue to look at uh, trends. You may be interested that we, uh, as a result of the COVID era, we've started a, a, another weekly piece which we've called Future Trends. Once again, that's available through our, our website and it's sort of picking up on some of those trends that we're seeing uh, as a result of, of COVID. So, and, and uh, it, it does, uh, it looks at, uh, it's looking at social indicators, political indicators, conflict indicators and development indicators. So I really encourage you to, to have a look at that future trends uh, report. It's not a report, it's um, curated material that we're, we're publishing each week. Thank you for the question.
we have uh, questions. The first one is, how does the IEP deal with side effects which might result from ranking countries? For example, lower budget allocations to lower ranking countries or teaching to the test. Yeah, sorry, you dropped out a little bit there. I'm just reading the the, the question uh, from uh, from Finn. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. Sorry, Finn, I'm not sure if I, I totally uh, understand the question. I, I think uh, I think we're heading does uh, does uh, our rankings have a have an impact on on countries? Does it create some side side effects? Uh, and the answer is what? what uh, the the answer is potentially uh, yes. Uh, I mean, we certainly become come under a range of criticisms, <laughs> and some of the criticism comes out of, out of the U.S., which uh, you know some observers feel that uh, the U.S. is is badly dealt with in, in the global peace index, uh, uh, and uh, you know that. That could be the case, as I said, where we don't put moral judgment into our work when the 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 business of identifying uh, identifying global data sets that are reliable and, and aggregating those uh, global data sets. Uh, you know, another example is uh, we call out Taiwan as a as an independent uh, state. We certainly uh, receive quite a bit of criticism uh, as as a as a result of that. Uh, but uh, we stay steadfast to to our uh, our values, if you like, is that, that we're an uh, independent, nonpartisan uh, organisation. Uh, we work hard to uh, to not only keep that independence, but that that appearance of, of independence. So uh, we we work hard at not being influenced by by global pressures. Uh, and but uh, you, your question is valid that uh, there is potentially a shadow created for particular states as a, as a result of, uh, of our, our work. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, I'm not sure that I, I fully answered it, uh, but I think I get the, 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 the meaning behind uh, uh, your question. Thank you. So they have uh, one more. If you can remember off the top of your head, what is Israel's position um, in the latest rankings? Uh, <laughs> sorry, no, I can't remember. <laughs> sorry, I always try and uh, uh, always try and think, or oh, where where were the questions might come, and uh, or usually swat up on what are the the countries I think might come under under question. Um, I'm sorry, I can't remember. I, I think it is medium to to lowly placed. Uh, Israel has a fairly high expenditure on, on uh, military, so its milex is, is fairly high from, from recollection, uh, which brings it down. I won't go looking at uh, data while I'm, while I'm uh, live, but I encourage you to, to log on to our website. Sorry, I don't have that uh, answer right at my fingertips. Um, I seem to recall that it is uh, uh, around uh, the, the hundreds, but I'm not 100% I'm not, not uh, on that. Uh, I certainly know that Milex is, uh, is is fairly high in Israel. Um, so uh, yeah, I encourage you to have a look at uh, Vision of Humanity. Have a look at uh, the rankings on uh, Vision of Humanity. And have a look at the uh, the trends, uh, and all of that is is available on Vision of Humanity website. Thank you. Sorry, I don't have a rounder question. Rounder answer for the question. And then the last question we have is uh, somebody asking if it's possible to get country details on each indicator for the domains presented. Uh, yes, uh, it is. Uh, certainly you can, uh, on the website, the, the, the ranking for each domain uh, sits behind. So if you hover over the country, country of interest, uh, you'll be able to bring up uh, A, it's, it's ranking, its position, its domain ranking, but also the indicators for, for each domain. So the website goes to that level of uh, granularity. Uh, and as I said, you can look back over about 10 years of data. Uh, I should uh, say that um, we also do, uh, and uh, for, for a number of uh, nation states that uh, use uh, the Institute's research 
to inform their uh, inform their policy and, and strategy positions uh, that we do to consultancy pieces and dive deeper on the, the data. I just uh, saw uh, uh, John, thank you very much. Uh, John picked up that uh, Israel sits at 145, so I was a little bit off the pace that it is uh, fairly lowly uh, ranked in, the, in the, the Global Peace Index. Thank you, John. All right, everyone, it looks like we've got everyone's questions answered. Thank you again to our special guests this evening, Charlie and Francesca, as well as all of you for joining us for this webinar. We're really thrilled that you were able to be a part of this and hope that you learned from this evening's engaging discussion. Keep in touch with the Office of Alumni Relations via social, as well as our website to see what future events and programs we have coming up. Thank you.